morning, church. Good to see you. You know, if I were to ask you today, what is a timeout? Someone would say, hey, you need to take a timeout. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That might be a bad thing, especially if you're talking about a kid, right? <laughs> you need a timeout. Oh, you've been there. But what if I were to say you need a timeout, a getaway, a pull back, if you will, to look and see why we do what we do. And as I prayed about this week, I was like, Lord, what, what do you want your people to hear? You know, these next several weeks. And one thing that came out as I looked around the world today was the shape it's in and to see all the hate and to see the darkness. And man, sometimes it's a, it's a frightening place when you look around. And maybe we need to pull back and remember the hope. Why do we do what we, what is, where's all this going, church? Where, where is this headed? Do we really have the goal in mind to give us the sustaining power that we need. Because, man, back, you know, the last 2,000 years, that's what the church did. It held out the power of hope and the afterlife and what was waiting to get people through those dark periods, to get people through those trying times where, man, it was rough, where you got the bubonic plague and people are dropping like flies and sometimes a, a, a long life was 45 years and things were awful. They always held out this hope, but something happened in the last few years. People started to get a horrible grasp of what was coming. I, I read recently of a, a good, godly guy. This guy was seminary educated eventually, but at this point, in a moment of brutal honesty, he actually said this, whenever I think about what waits for me, for eternity, for heaven, it makes me depressed. I can't stand the thought of endless, boring tedium. I would rather cease to exist when I die and then he said, wait for it, heaven doesn't sound much better than hell. What? Where did he get this? Now, he's just being honest, right? This is, I don't, I don't judge him for this. I appreciate his candor. But he had been in church and had picked up a view of what waits for him that is so not in the Bible. I don't know where it comes. Well, I do. I know it comes from the culture. And it comes from the enemy. Who stands to benefit if we lose our hope of heaven? Who stands to benefit? The enemy. Who's behind this? Who wants to get us distracted? Who wants us to trade in shallow imitations and try to make heaven on earth right now, try to live a life of comfort at the expense of not realizing what's coming? This guy right here, he picked up such a, a normal, that we see it in cartoons all over. This beautiful one here, a far side cartoon. This guy's, here he is sitting on the cloud in heaven and he's thinking what we're all thinking. I don't know. I kind of wish I brought a magazine. <laughs> is, is this all there is? Who would want to go to that? I wouldn't. That is not what waits for us. Who wants to evangelize and tell your neighbors about Jesus for that? Hey, come on. Repent of your sins. Be born again. You can join me. We can be bored forever. Woo! You know, who's with me? Nobody. That is not, I don't promise much. If I can't back it up in scriptures, if I can't 100% guarantee what I'm saying. I try not to say it to you, but I can promise you this. That is not what waits for you. That is not, God is not boring. Heaven is not boring. What is coming, the new heavens and the new earth, is absolutely not boring by any stretch of the imagination. When kids get in the family truckster, in the station wagon, in the minivan, you load them up to a place they've never been, what do you hear? You hear the complaint, I don't want to go on this vacation. I've never been there. It sounds so boring. Wah, wah, wah. Right? On and on. And then after spending a week there and it's time to come home, what do they say? We don't have, do we have to leave? I don't want to leave. Why? Because they're familiar with it. They know it. It is natural for us to be pessimistic about things we don't understand. It is natural for us to go, oh, that doesn't sound so great. Well, you know what? That doesn't sound great. If that's it, sign me out. I don't need that. I don't need a cloud. We can just cease to exist. But thankfully, that's not even close to what awaits those who know him. God has so much incredible things in store for him. Remember, heaven and the future represents God himself. And God, if you know scriptures, is nothing. If not, he's not boring. He's, he is all creativity. He is the source of everything that is amazing. So let me ask you a question. Do not answer this out loud. Just to get you thinking. How excited, be honest, how excited are you about heaven? How excited are you about what waits for you for the afterlife? 
Does it motivate your everyday living? Does it enter your thoughts, maybe occasionally? Or is it a blip on the radar screen that every now and then when that arm sweeps over, beep, beep, you think, oh yeah, that is out there, like some fog. Huh, I wonder if it's going to be nice. Where do you stand? Does it motivate you? Because it motivated the church and the early Christian fathers to no end. It's what allowed them to die a martyr's death, knowing how real this was, how incredible, how much endless delights and joys. It fueled their everyday life. But in the last hundred years, this has come off the radar. And we don't talk about it. And we don't know it. We can't even share it with our friends, with our family, what's to come. So we're going to change that. Today, we're going to pull back. We're going to get a little sneak peek for some and a reminder for others of what really waits for you. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 21 and hold on tight. Revelation 21. While you get that up, I'll welcome those who are joining us online. Good to have you. Thank you for streaming with us. Revelation 21. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. All right, everybody got it? Follow along with me. And it says, Then I, this is John, saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Okay, so at this point, the holy city is is apparently hovering. It is over the earth at this point, and John sees it at this point, at the end of the millennium, descending to the earth, okay? He's actually seeing it come down out of heaven. Verse three, read on. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now where? Among his people. He will live where? With them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. This right here should settle the matter. We don't just sprout wings and float off into some cloud, okay? He is coming. We will be here, a new heavens and a new earth. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death. Woo! No more sorrow, no crying, no pain. All these things are gone for a few days. Forever. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne says, look, I am making everything new. And then I love this, as if to cement this, he says to me, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. That is powerful. That is awesome. This is what awaits us. We don't grasp this. So John has the frustrating task, again, of trying to put into English and human words or or Greek at this time what he's seeing. And it's tough. Would you like that task? Describe the indescribable. So we're going to try today to describe as best we can, and I'm going to put it in some modern day terms, the largest home on the planet, the largest private residence today is the Istana Nural Iman Palace. This is the residence of the Sultan of Brunei. You won't believe how big this is. Now to me, this just looks like some kind of crazy hybrid of Space Mountain and Epcot, kind of fused together, but apparently he likes this. This took years and years to build, $1.4 billion back in the 80s. I can't even imagine what it is today. Guess how many square foot this is? 100,000? 300,000? 700,000? This is over 1 million square feet in his house. It's pushing 2 million square feet. 1,788 rooms are in his private residence. 1,788 rooms. Guess how many bathrooms? Five? (laughs) Ten? 257 lavatories. That is a lot of sewage. That is incredible. Five swimming pools, a 110-car garage. Put your boat in that, huh? 110 car garage, wait for it, and enough air-conditioned polo stables to house all 200 of his prized ponies. Wow. A banquet hall. I didn't even mention that. Oh, and don't forget the private mosque that holds 1,500 worshipers, private tennis courts, all of this, and again, it cost $1.4 million, a billion when it was built in the 80s. Now, as grand as this is, y'all, this pales in comparison what awaits for you and for me 
and the new heavens and the new earth. Our heavenly dwelling place. You know, you know all those verses where it says, behold, you know, there's streets of gold and there's pearly gates and all those things. We're going to go and I'm going to make a mansion for you. I'll prepare it. And when I come, I'll come back. If I weren't so, I would have told you all that. That's coming in the new heavens and the new earth. When we die currently, before the new heavens and the new earth is available, we go to the current heaven where God is, where our loved ones are. That is a beautiful, incredible paradise place. There's nothing lacking, and it's phenomenal. But this takes place after that. Behold, I am making all things new, a new heavens and a new earth, wholly renovated. It is going to be phenomenal. That is what is coming for us, and it, it pales in comparison to man's greatest thing that we can build. Man's greatest with what God has waiting for you. Remember, scriptures tell us plainly, no eye is seen, no ear is here. You, you can't even imagine the things that wait for those who know the Lord, who have been faithful to it. But more than it's worth in dollars, hear me, hear me. Nothing compares to the fact that we will be with God. We will be able to see our creator. We'll be able to look and we won't burst into flames. We will actually be able to bask in his glory. And it is going to be so phenomenal. Now, no one has seen the new Jerusalem except one person, John, here in this revelation that he's given. And it's unbelievable for us to grasp it. But that is the crux of the matter for the believer. And that's the first point you need to grasp today. We don't see in order to believe. We believe in order to see. And the world has its backwards. They say, oh, no, no, don't believe it until you see it. But that's not how faith is. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, God is asking us to walk by faith, not by sight. Even though we haven't seen the new Jerusalem with our eyes, we believe it. We know it's true because it is clearly described in Scripture. Not just in Revelation, but in Ephesians, Isaiah, there's all kinds of passages. God's promises are true, and we will eventually see that which we believed. I love how St. Augustine puts it. It's a beautiful quote. He says this, Faith is to believe what you do not see, and the reward of this faith is to see what you believe. What a powerful, beautiful quote. Now, the New Jerusalem, as it comes, it has many names. You may have heard it called the Tabernacle of God, or the City of God, or the City Four Square, or the City Built Not by Human Hands, the Celestial City, the Zion, the Heavenly Jerusalem. Whatever name you give it, it is quite literally going to be heaven on earth for you. It is everything you've dreamed about, and then some. It is everything your heart has longed for, and then some. It is every void you have in your current being fulfilled. Eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard the joys that wait for you. The, it is going to be so, um, it's imagined, unimagined blessing because God is going to dwell with his people here forever. We don't know that. There is, a, there is a fallen world that we wrestle with every single day, and this will finally be the fulfillment of all of God's promises. His awesomeness will be on full display for the first time, and we will bask in his glory. It'll harken back almost to that Adam and Eve time where they could walk with God in the cool of the day and talk with him, but on an exponentially greater level. Have you ever been cold? You ever been in a cold place? Let's just say like a, I don't know, a worship center or something, and you <laughs> can't wait and you step outside and the sun hits you. It feels so good. Whoa, preach it. Woo, Tracy knows. And it's just so amazing. You're like, oh, this feels so awesome. That feeling, that, 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 that one second, and after that I start sweating and I hate it, but you know what I mean. If you could just capsulate that one second and multiply that times 47 quadrillion, you would have the first instant as a shadow of what is coming. It is so, we can't even grasp it. It's just, it's so, I'm going to try to do our, the, the very best I can to, to give you something to hang on to. Look with me at Revelation 21.16 as we start grasping just the sheer dimensions of this. Revelation 21.16 says this, the city is laid out as a square. And its length is as great as the width. And he measured it, this is John, with the city, with the rod. He was given a rod, told to measure this. 1,500 miles, or 12,000 furlongs, depending on your, on your translation. And its length and width and height are all equal. What? 12,000 furlongs? Depending on which cubit you use to measure this, that's between 1,400 and 1,500 miles. Now, most people realize this description only allows room for two shapes for your future home to be. The most famous one is the cube, because we think of length, height, it sounds like a giant cube, a giant square. But I wanna mention, because there are some theologians out there who dispute that and say, no, it's actually a pyramid. And the only reason they say that is because technically, you could still fit those dimensions, 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high, although this isn't as high. From the top of the peak straight down, technically could be 1,500 miles. 
So if you ever hear that it's a holy pyramid, that's where that's coming from. Let me tell you why I tend to think it is the cube and why most theologians go that way. Here's why. Y'all remember that obscure, really cool verse in Hebrews where God is talking about and Moses is, is, is recounting this, this time when he was on the mountain and God is giving him the original blueprints of the tabernacle. This predates even Solomon's temple. But the tabernacle, and they want to bring in the Ark of the Covenant, and they're building all this, and it looks a lot like a temple, but it looks portable. It looks like a tent, a tent of meeting. And they have this thing, and this, this great big instructions are given to, to Moses, and, and the, the short of it here is, you can read it with me, these things serve as a copy and a shadow of what is to come, of what is in heaven. And God is very adamant in saying, Moses, you need to build this exactly as I tell you. Don't cut corners. Don't get cute. Don't think, well, this would be prettier here. Let's put some drapes here. No, you build this exactly as I'm telling you. Because this is a shadow, a copy, apparently, of what is in heaven, the current existing heaven. Okay? Now, remember that. Because people miss this. Don't miss that. That's the tabernacle. The temple, isn't it interesting, when we see it built hundreds of years later, that it has cube-shaped dimensions, just like the New Jerusalem, and it appears to be a foreshadowing of this temple of Solomon. The Holy of Holies is also a perfect cube. It's 20 by 20 by 20 inside. This was the most holy place anyone could go. In fact, the high priest could only go in there one day a year. Anybody remember what it's called? Day of Atonement? Yom Kippur? Anybody? Anybody? Go on. Go on. Okay. All right. Good. That is also a perfect cube. Now, couple that with the, the, the admonition, Moses, you need to build this exactly what it is. When Jesus died on the cross, up until this point, this is where God's manifest glory was, was where they beheld it, okay? When he said, it is finished, what happened to that veil separating the Holy of Holies from the holy place? It tore from top to bottom. It ripped in half as if Jesus was able to finally say, it is finished to tell us die. No longer am I confined to a place, but I am available through the Holy Spirit to dwell in the hearts of the believers. You are now the temple. And it was no longer confined to just this one square cubicle room. In fact, in verse 22, you'll see that John says, when I looked at this new Jerusalem, I couldn't find a temple. I didn't see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb evidently are its temple. The whole world becomes his temple. So if the new Jerusalem serves as the capital of the new heavens and the new earth, his capital city, some people rightly ask, how is it possible for us to make our pilgrimage there? How is it possible for all believers to fit, to live there, if that's where he is building a new home for you? And that's an awesome question, so let's dig deep in this. If the new holy city is laid out as a breathtaking cube, the enormity of it is something I think we honestly fail to grasp. The Bible tells us that it is 12,000 furlongs, so that's 14 to 1,500 miles wide, deep, and high. With those dimensions just described there, let me put it in terms that you would recognized today. The base alone would make it a staggering 2.25 million square miles. And that's the base. That's the first floor. Now imagine we see a skyscraper off in the distance like, whoa, that's tall, man, 37 stories. Yeehaw. Now imagine a thousand stories. You're still not at a mile high. Now imagine this rising into the air 1,500 miles. That's what he's built for you. Think about that. The enormity of it is so, so it is more room than every believer who has ever lived in the course of history added together would still have ample room. Now remember, people go, well, how, do you, how would you get around in that? I love what David Jeremiah says. He says, did you forget you'll have a resurrected body? Remember what we talked about four weeks ago? The things your resurrected body can do that your current body can't? Jesus could do things in his resurrected body, and when we see him, we will be like him, and he was able to think where he wanted to go, and he could go. You'll be able to visit people. You'll be able to say, 58th floor, please, boom, whatever, you know, I don't know, and translate up there. We don't grasp all the mysteries, but our resurrected body doesn't have the limitations that our physical body does. So please don't get winded and go, how am I going to visit Granny over in Phoenix on this side when I'm living over here on the North Carolina side of this, okay? So grasp these, these, these dimensions, and John is trying his best to give us the, the descriptions of the radiance and glory, but we're going to walk through this and, and hit a few highlights just so you can have a taste of it. The infinite brilliance is described here in verse 11 of chapter 21. He says, everything he sees, the radiance and glory, is like that of a precious jewel, like as jasper, but clear as crystal. 
It's here where we start to see such magnificent descriptions that we start fumbling to grasp them and internalize them. He's giving us, as best he can, his job of describing the indescribable. Again, that is a tough job. Would you like that job? That is so hard. You notice his frustration because he says over and over lots of similes. He'll say, it's like something else. And it's almost as if something else. And he's using similes as best he can. It's like this to help us just have a glimpse to stir our hearts as to what is waiting for. Now, when we look at the splendor of heaven, in verse 12, John begins to talk about the general appearance in the exterior design. Now, he is saying here, as best he can, this thing will be fantastically large, but I don't think we grasp this. This is one of the first things that I had to grasp when I realized just how serious God takes the accuracy of his word. So like John, I'm going to attempt to put this in terms we can grasp. I want you to look at this picture of the tallest things we have currently man-made. You recognize the Empire State Building? Recognize the World Trade Centers before they came down, Petronas Towers, Freedom Tower, Taipei Tower, and the Burj Dubai or the Burj Khalifa. Tallest man-made structure at this point. Kind of shaped like a giant pyramid, okay? This still isn't one mile high. It's the closest we've come, but it's still not even one mile. Okay, I want you to remember this shape. Everybody take a mental picture, got it? All right, look at this next one. This is what you just saw, okay? This little tiny skyscraper, the tallest thing we have, tallest man-made structure, and then over here, we have the tallest God-made structure that we know of, Mount Everest. This is five miles high. Your home is 1,500 miles high. Mount Everest, five miles. Picture this towering in the expanse of space, descending to the earth, making, I mean, it is, do we grasp this? This is, this is incredible. When I look at this, I think th this is truly a city fit for a king. And it will have radiance, and it will sparkle, and it will be so, so amazing because when we build something today, we're happy if we can get one good foundation laid that doesn't crack and start to shift and all the North Carolina clay, I know it all, and it starts to shift and get all funky. Holy City doesn't have one foundation or two or five or seven. It has 12 foundations poured, not of cement, but of solid, precious stones, layer after layer, one layer of emerald, it says, one layer of ruby, one layer of, of chrysophase, and, and, and all these, these beautiful stone, diamond and, and sapphire, and all these things layered, and each one has the name of a disciple on it. The walls are made of jasper. The city's pure gold, pure as glass. Now, if it seems strange to think of the city of gold, pure as glass, let me help you out. The English word jasper that John uses here is a transliteration. It is not a direct translation. It is a transliteration of the Greek word that basically is, the closest we can describe it is as clear as a diamond. So that the walls, everything you see doesn't consume light, it doesn't block it out. It is God's window allowing his glory, remember he illuminates everything. He is shining out through it like a diamond held out in space, but 1,500 miles wide of this jasper that is clear and the gold is clear. The, the purity of it is incredible. We get excited when we think, ooh, big walls, it's going to be great. And we look at this and we think the Great Wall of China is impressive. It's 20 feet wide. The walls of the new city are 250 feet wide. That's 25 feet tall. John talks about 250 foot high walls. And the gates are never closed because there's no more enemy. Everything is dealt with. At this time, the lake of fire finally has its residence, and you don't have to worry about these things. Now, when we see that you have the 12 apostles listed on each of the foundations, we see also that this cube has 12 gates. Each tribe is listed over a gate, three gates per side that you can go in and out. You're able to freely come and go, and you'll be ruling with the earth, ruling on, uh, with what David was talking about. This is so amazing. This is staggeringly cool. So get this, okay? As Christ followers, we will have the privilege in this time to know and meet every redeemed follower who has ever lived. The fact that there are Hebrew tribes listed there should settle once and for all the inclusion of Old Testament saints because we will know them and they are listed right there. Do you know what this means? Until now, you've had to read about Moses and Noah and Adam. But at the 
celebration feasts because you will be able to eat. You don't have to, but you will be able to eat for pleasure in this time. You will be able, your body will be healthy. You'll be whole in the celebration feast. Imagine, just, this, is, this is just me thinking, that you're sitting across an empty seat and you see the name tag and you can't wait to see who's going to be seated across me. And you reach out and you take it and you turn it and it says, Adam. The Adam. The one who was scooped up by God's hands, a glob of dirt. He breathed into it and it became a man. The only one that probably didn't have a belly button. Right? There was no umbilical cord. I mean, think about that. Did, did he need a belly button? I don't know if God would and added one or if it just was total six-pack. I don't know, but you're sitting here across from him. You could ask him, you know, Adam, do you have a belly button? Can we settle this once and for all? The whole world wants to know. Or maybe Eve. Maybe you want to go up to Eve and say, <laughs> I've been meaning to talk to you guys because all this started with you. And Now, there's no judgment. Not much, but there's a little bit. But when you see them, and then you look to your right, and I'm thinking, you know, what is it going to be? What if this name tag, I turn it over and it says, Paul. I can, what was it like when you were caught up into the third heaven? You know, was it in body? Was it out of body? Because you weren't sure then, but I bet you are now. What was it like? Tell me about that Damascus Road experience. Or Peter, you know, or Ruth. I mean, all these things. Think about it. You will see them, and you will be able to go up and interview them. And if there's a mob of people around them, and a big swarm, it's okay. You got all eternity. You can wait. And if you come across a line in heaven, I have it on good source, every line is equipped with a Disney Fast Pass. You are able to skip the line and get ahead. <laughs> True story. Not kidding. That's, uh, that's just something I wanted you guys to, to see. Look at, look at the, 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 when people talk about gold, one of the things that always bothered me was, how do they say gold is clear and how on earth is it gold? The Greek word for gold is this right here. It is the word krusion. And krusion can be translated as gold, gold overlay, or gold jewelry. In any matter, it's translated as gold, okay? Gold, gold lay, gold overlay, gold jewelry. Like the four food groups, sugar, candy, candy corns, candy canes, syrup, all those kind of things. This is why we believe John is being literal. Because this word, remember, always, always, always give God a chance to say what he means on first First value, face value, right as you read it, okay? Then you go out from there. If you don't give God a chance to speak plainly, then you never do. If you already start down a slippery slope and you interpret everything symbolically, you do him a great disservice of being able to mean what he says, possibly in the simplest terms. John isn't just throwing out random symbolic descriptive terms. How do we know that? Because earlier in this verse, God is seen giving an angel a rod and saying, go measure this. And he's using specific terms, and he's naming specific stones, and he's being very intentional and very specific. Remember last week, we taught context is everything. The context used here, when he's talking about gold, gold is so pure, the crucian gold is not like the gold we have today. When we look at gold, there's hidden gold here. This is, this is so amazing. Look at this picture here. This is what we think of gold today. Liquid, smelted metal that you can take the dross and all the impurities off. And we can get it 99.99, we think, pure. And it has this faint yellowish tint to it. And when it cools, it looks like this. And this is what we think of as gold. But gold and diamonds, we're still not grasping pure. We're still not grasping how amazing. John is being given so many specifics in mind, it makes perfect sense to think in this context that John is having an eyewitness description. The gold is not going to be in this undesirable condition like jewelers have to make it. All these impurities will be gone. Now, we believe that this is transparent in order to reflect the pure light of God's glory. Here's why. There is, in the holy city, no light. It says there's no need for sun or moon or any of that because the glory of God will be the light. It is literally going to shine out like a diamond that you see on the horizon. God's ability to purify us isn't limited to just gold. Here's where it turns awesome. You need to start thinking about your, your glorified body. God has purified all who enter the heavenly city. That means there will be no pettiness. There's no gossip. There's no slander. There's no unknowing somebody. You will know as you are known. And it is going to be so incredible. But never forget why we are there. We are purified because of the blood of Jesus. Always point back to him. This great verse in 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and purify, purify us from all unrighteousness. 
So we're purified. The gold is purified. And I love this, this funny story about the man who's on his deathbed. He's rich, and he's been negotiating with God. He's been a good, good godly man all his life, but he's really, really not sure he's ready to go. And he says, Lord, if I could just take my treasures with me. And God says, no. He says, Can I just take some of it? And he says, you know what? You've been faithful. I'm going to let you do what I've never let anyone do. I'm going to let you take one suitcase of anything you want with you to heaven. And the old man says, oh, thank you, Lord. And he loads it full of all the gold bricks he can find. And it's so heavy. And he dies, and he shows up at the gate, and St. Peter has not gotten the message. And he, he's holding it with both hands because it's super heavy. And he puts it up on the table, and Peter says, what is that? And he says, my treasure. He says, you know you can't bring that. And he says, no, no, I talked to God. He said I could, one suitcase. Peter checks it out, comes back, and says, I can't believe this. This has never happened. But evidently, you are a faithful steward, and he has allowed you to bring. But I got to know. What have you brought? Please let me examine your contents before you go in. And he opens it up, and Peter is so confused as he sees those gold bricks, and he says, sir, why on earth would you bring pavement with you? Because that is what they walk on. We hoard it, little carrots. So I'm like, oh, this is .0007 of a carrot. The foundations are poured by the mile, feet thick of ruby and sapphire and gold. And up there, it's so casual. It's to be walked, do you get the grandeur? Do you, we're going to be like, ah, oh, this is phenomenal. And that's not even the highlight. Jesus is the highlight. Having peace and being with God forever. It is going to be so stinking amazing. We pursued these, these, these little treasures and these trinkets. But I think God is laughing at times, wondering, we're so content to splash around in the kiddie pool when he's saying, wait, I have this ocean waiting for you. And you're so content in the kiddie pool. You haven't even dreamed what waits for you. Stay faithful. It is so worth it. Stay faithful. Store up your treasures in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal, where moths don't corrupt it and rust doesn't eat it alive. It's almost as if the memories of that original perfect paradise are built into our DNA from the original Adam and Eve. I love how C.S. Lewis says it. He says it beautifully. He says, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. And we were. The reason you long and yearn to live in an ideal paradise is because you were made for that. And it was corrupted. The reason you long for holy, open fellowship with your creator is because you were made for that. You didn't make that up. God did. This was God's plan. And he will make all things new. And we can't wait for this everlasting life. Now, I would be an awful, awful Christian, let alone pastor, if I assumed everybody had already made the reservation. Because the scripture says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to life. If you take a poll, the majority of people alive, not just Americans, the majority of people believe in heaven, and they all believe they're also going. But that's not what Scripture says. You must make your reservation. You must do it. Spiritual rebirth takes place in this life, not the afterlife. This is the time. This is the chance. No one goes to heaven by accident. That is not our default. That's what the devil wants everyone to believe. No one just says, oh, oops, I just stumbled and died into heaven. Well, look at this. Isn't this great? That makes a mockery of the blood of Christ. No one goes by default. That is not our default setting. That is why we have Jesus. Heaven is God's prepared place for prepared people. Are you prepared? I hope you can say that. See, what we're going to do different today is I'm not going to give this closed invitation time where we come and we just sing a song. I'm going to stay after we dismiss. I'm going to send you out, and I'm going to stay here as long as you want. If you want to talk about this, I don't want to rush this into a two-minute little segment. If you want to talk about this and you're not sure, please talk to me. I'll stay as long as you want. As long as you buy me a cheeseburger, I am happy to talk to you. And we can go through this. This is of utmost importance. We prepare for heaven, and God prepares heaven for us. That's the deal. One of the greatest passages in all of literature comes from C.S. Lewis when he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. I love this passage. We see the mighty lion known as Aslan. Aslan is the Christ figure. He represents Christ throughout these, these, these whole series. And the very last words written were this. And as Aslan spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion, but things began to change. 
he began to take on a new look and things began to happen that were so great, so beautiful that I literally cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of the stories and we can most truly say the old cliche, they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was just the beginning. Now the real story was about to start. And their life in the world and all their adventures in Narnia, as great as they'd been, they had only been the opening of the cover and the title page. All those books was just the title page of heaven. And now, at last, they are beginning chapter one of the greatest story, which no one on earth has read yet, which goes on and on forever and ever, each chapter getting better than the one before it. That's what waits for you. Heaven is going to be awesome. Let it ignite a fire in you, church. Let it put a pep in your step, a zeal in your belly to live a holy life, to tell others about it. It is not a wispy cloud. That is not what's waiting for you. It is going to be phenomenal. I struggle to even put my hands around it. Let it give you that extra lift as you leave this place today. Can I pray for you? Bow with me. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you left us the most incredible love letter, and it is the roadmap for us. Lord, may we take it into our heart, translate it, make us on fire for you to share the good news, the hope of tomorrow. You are so good to us. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.